Hello, hello. Welcome to Be Bold America. I'm your host, Jill Cody. Our program today is speaking with Tom Hartman on his newest book, The Hidden History of American Democracy, Rediscovering Humanity's Ancient Way of Living. In his latest book in the Hidden History series, Tom Hartman writes a powerful sweeping history and analysis of American democracy. He shows how democracy is the one form of government most likely to produce peace and happiness among people. Now our democracy is under targeted threat. How do we save our country from those who think we have too much democracy? We have big things to do. Now our guest today is that very Tom Hartman. However, our program engineer is still trying to reach him on the phone. So I'm going to continue uh, introducing him and hoping he'll be patched in. So Tom Hartman is a national and international syndicated progressive talk show host. Uh, His program is called the Tom Hartman Program. Talkers Magazine named him America's number one most important progressive radio host. He is a four-time recipient of the Project Censored Award, and he is also a New York Times bestselling author of more than 30 books that have been translated into multiple languages. His social media sites are TomHartman.com, TheHartmanReport.com, or you may reach him on Twitter at Tom underscore Hartman, H-A-R-T-M-A-N-N. Since we only have Tom for the first half hour of our program, I've invited Andrew Goldenkrantz, chair of the Santa Cruz County Democratic Party, to finish out the hour with me, and he is also online. Hello, Tom. Is it, it is such Hi. a delight to have you on the show. Welcome back to Be Bold America. Are you there? Well, thank you. I am. I'm, I'm uh, Yay. Uh, sorry about the noise in the background. I'm, I'm driving, but uh, oh, dear. I, somehow I just didn't make it out of my calendar. I'm oh, sorry. no, no, but no. All okay. is good. I'm here. All is good. You're so. here. We love you, and we're delighted that you could squeak in half hour here in your car. Um, my pleasure. I also want to say hello to Andrew now, too. Hello, Andrew. Thank you for joining us from your vacation in Tahoe. Hello, Jill. Nice. Uh, thanks for having me. Well, uh, I'm delighted hey, that you could join me. Yes, Tom, meet Andrew. Andrew, meet Tom. Yeah, hey. Good to meet you. Tom, since hey. we only have you for the first half hour of the show, why not begin with some of that most exciting, fascinating, and key information you chose to include in the hidden history of American democracy? Can we really ever have too much democracy? No, democracy <laughs> is is uh, is actually embedded in our DNA. It was one of the most fascinating things I discovered when I was researching the book. Um, some oh, about a decade ago, uh, two scientists in the UK, uh, Ken Conrad and and uh, Dr. Roper, I'm forgetting the last name, um, uh, hypothesized that all animals would, in all social animals, which is. 99% of all animals would engage in uh, democracy as their primary decision making process which flies in the face of our popular mythology which is that you know species have alpha animals and the alpha animals make the decisions they they postulated that the alpha animals would have first choice of sexual partner um, consistent with darwinian you know pass along the strongest genes but outside of that would not have um, decision making power when it came to the overall community and this has now been verified in multiple studies. The, the most fascinating, right after they published that, was about uh, about a year later, it was done by some scientists who published this in uh, New Scientist. Uh, 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 James Randerson was the, uh, was the guy. And they had a, a set of, uh, a herd of red deer living in a forest near the University of Essex in the U.K. And so they put, you know, cameras in the trees to watch the deer and see how they decided like when to go to the to the water hole. You know, there were three different water holes in, in the area. How do they know which one to go to, and how do they know when to go? These are consequential decisions. If they wait too long, some animals will become dehydrated. If they go too soon, some animals won't get the, the right amount of nutrients. And uh, what they found was that the animals would just kind of randomly start pointing their bodies at different, uh, at you know, the three different water holes. And when 50% plus one of the deer had pointed their their heads toward one of the water holes, within about two minutes, all of the herd would assemble and go to that particular water hole. Um, In our Constitution, we've got a uh, a higher threshold for really dangerous decisions, like amending the Constitution that requires two-thirds of Congress. 
And uh, so they, they tried, you know, let's up the stakes. They put a predator or a stuffed one, you know, with the, with the proper smells and things, a stuffed wolf, uh, near one of the watering holes. And what they found was that then, you know, once there was a predator in the vicinity, the, uh, the deer would not make a decision until two-thirds of the deer were all pointing at the same watering hole, which is pretty incredible. That's fascinating. So I, I, yeah, I called Ken Conrad, and I said, you know, what happened when you published this? Because it was published in Nature, which is a you know, peer-reviewed journal. And he said it was amazing. He said the bug people uh, were the first to call me. They said, you know, we're seeing the same thing with balls of gnats, uh, you know, like you see in the air in the summer. And how do they know how to move? You know, well, it turns out that every wing beat is a vote. And when a particular gnat, you know, moves a, a quarter inch up or a quarter inch to the left or a few degrees to the right or whatever, when 51% of them have taken that position, the entire ball of gnats moves. And then a fish guy called, an ichthyologist, and said, uh, yeah, we're seeing the same thing with, with fish. This accounts for schooling activity. I had always thought they were, like, telepathic or something, you know. And uh, and with birds, he had a bird guy call and say, yeah, we see this with flocks of birds. It's the exact same thing. Every wing beat is a vote. And when 51% vote for, you know, a, a three-degree move to the right, the whole flock moves three degrees to the right as they're migrating or flying or whatever. So this is the default in nature for all animals, including humans. And that's why I think, you know, when you look at some of the, the really uh, in-depth anthropological works, like, uh, for example, uh, The Dawn of Everything, Graeber's new book, you know, that goes back and looks at how people lived 20, 30, 40,000 years ago. The, the, the vast majority of Aboriginal and Indigenous communities do this democratic decision-making, and that's uh, actually where we got the idea for the United States it was from um, Native American, by and large. Well, I had no idea that the Iroquois played such a vital role in our Constitution. Yeah, it's, it, it was substantial. You know, most people think that um, we, well, in fact, the, you know, the, the popular mythology is that we got our our Constitution and our ideas of democracy from, you know, Hobbes and Locke and, and uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau and uh, Montesquieu and whatnot. And it turns out that back in the late 1600s, throughout the 1800s, there was a, uh, uh, a, a fad, as it were, a very, you know, it was a very popular thing in France to have these called salons, which is mostly it was uh, upper middle class and wealthy women, and invite people of note to their home. And then, uh, you know, people would come from the, from the, uh, the intelligentsia and the upper classes of society and hang out there and, you know, and see what's going on. And um, in the late 1600s, the French, the French missionaries had made substantial inroads into the, uh, the, uh, a number of the Iroquois Confederacy uh, tribes, particularly the, Hur- the Huron. And a lot of the Huron had learned um, how to speak French uh, very competently. And so in the, in the early and mid-1700s, a number of these Native Americans from the Hurons uh, traveled to Europe at the request of, of the French missionaries who had been publishing stories about, you know, the, these democratic societies um, in, um, in France for some time. And they would, they would travel to, to France and participate in these salons. And uh, Rousseau was in one, and Locke was in one. <laughs> I feel like these guys who got these ideas, the, the Enlightenment thinkers, the Enlightenment Europeans who got their ideas about democracy, got them from the Native Americans. Oh, my. And, 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 yeah, and this was not a surprise, by the way, to people like Franklin and Jefferson and Adams, who all you know had lived with and worked with and known Native Americans for a long, long time. Um, but it was it, it's fascinating that, uh, the, you know, well, first of all, it wasn't Greek and Roman, you know, the Greek democracy, you know, which uh, failed after a, a short period of time, or the Roman Republic, which really was never a democracy. Um, it was it was Native Americans. And, 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 you know, as you look across the world, you find that it's not just, it wasn't just Native Americans. There were, there were, you know, tribal people all over the world had figured out how to live democratically. We'd, we'd had 300,000 years of trial and error to figure this out. And it turns out that the, uh, in fact, there was a, the, the dictatorial regimes are, are actually the minority. There was a fascinating piece. This isn't in my book because it was just published last week, but it was published in Nature, you know, the peer reviewed journal. And um, that they're, they're doing some really great archaeological work in Mesoamerica and Central America. And what they found was 
dozen, well, hundreds of communities, uh, many of them small, but some of them as large as several hundred thousand people, where there's literally no evidence of poverty and no evidence of great wealth and, um, and no evidence of warfare. And, uh, you know, what they found is that these were the societies that were more likely to survive invasion, they were more likely to survive drought, they were more likely to survive natural disasters, and, uh, and, and they were, because they were more resilient, because they were small-D democratic. The, it turns out that the reason that's in our genes, the reason that's part of the nature of all animals, is that it's the, it's the safest way to make decisions. There literally is wisdom in the crowds, you know, they're, 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 there's something to that. It's real. Well, skipping a little bit into your book, but I think it's an important question, uh, again, because uh, we feel rich white men are supposed to run the country. You explain the destructive myth that the United States was founded exclusively of, by, and for rich white men. Can you uh, give us your thoughts on that, too? Yeah, this is this is a meme that uh, rich white men are very fond of. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I bet. <laughs> yeah. And and uh, and in fact, it's not true at all. Um, the there were rich white men in the United States in the 1770s and 1780s. Um, by and large, they took the side of the British, the very very wealthy. The wealthiest of all the people who signed the Declaration of Independence was John Hancock, and his uh, total assets, his total net worth uh, in today's dollars, was around seven hundred thousand dollars. He would have been upper middle class. Um, uh, you know, a number of the other people who participated in that era, uh, you know, Jefferson died in bankruptcy, George Washington died in bankruptcy, or on the, on the, on the verge of it. Uh, James Madison, his family lost their house, you know, within a generation. There are literally no, there were, there were no dynastic families among the founders. There were, there were some from that time. The Johnson family had a, had a, a castle on the Rhine, or on the uh, Hudson River. Um, but they fled to Canada during the Revolutionary War. Most of the really profoundly rich, and there were, uh, you know, a few, and there were, most of them were associated with the British East India Company, fled the country. So, uh, number one, it was mostly what you might call upper middle class and middle class guys. Um, number two, um, John, uh, or excuse me, uh, I'm forgetting his first name, but is it, oh, Forrest McDonald did this in-depth study in 1956. He wanted to uh, to see if James Beard, James and Mary Beard, in 1929, uh, wrote the History of America, which was you know one of the more popular history books of American history. And and uh, Charles and Mary, Mary was a Marxist, and Charles was a socialist, and they were professors at Columbia University. And they hypothesized that the Constitution was a document designed to perpetuate wealth in the United States. And so they, so McDonald went back to see, okay, who was in favor of and who was opposed to the Constitution. And what he found was that the majority of the people who, uh, he went through the uh, ratifying conventions for each one of the 13 states and looked at who attended and how they voted. And what he found was that the vast majority of people in state after state after state who voted for the Constitution were people who were in debt, small farmers, subsistence farmers, teachers, um, you know, the, 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 the kind of just the run-of-the-mill middle-class professions or the poor. And the people who were opposed to the Constitution, by and large, were the very wealthy. For example, Patrick Henry was opposed to the Constitution. He was the wealthiest slave owner in Virginia, one of the, one of the truly wealthy people. He had over 360 enslaved people. Um, you know, give me liberty or give me death was his mm-hmm. <laughs> And um, and he was the reason why James Madison, he at the Virginia ratifying convention, he argued against the Constitution because he said that Article One, Section Eight, which gave the president the power to call up the uh, the state militias and, uh, during time of crisis, uh, he was afraid that that would allow a president to call up the Virginia state militia, which was also the Virginia slave patrol. And so the the first draft of the Second Amendment said for the security of a free nation. And James Madison, um, after telling Henry to his face that he because they were both from Virginia, this was uh, at their ratifying convention, that he thought that Henry was paranoid, um, went ahead and changed the word nation to the word state uh, to you know make it clear that they were protecting the the militia of Virginia, the the slave patrol, from being called up because Patrick Henry was. And he said so. He was quite concerned that um, some future president would do exactly what Abe Lincoln did, which is basically, uh, you know, try to destroy uh, slavery in the South, um, you know, by going after their militia. 
This is a time to take a quick break. You're listening to Be Bold America on KSQD 89.5, 89.7, and 90.7 FM. Listen globally online at ksqd.org website. We're speaking with Tom Hartman, and our topic today is on his newest book, The Hidden History of American Democracy, Rediscovering Humanity's Ancient Way of Living. I'm your host, Jill Cody. Following our successful signal expansion campaign, K-Squid welcomes our new listeners in Salinas, Watsonville, and Carmel. Now at 89.5, 89.7, and 90.7 FM. Make all of them a preset on your radio so you stay with the squid wherever you go. We're back, Tom. Um, Did you know that KSQD Board of Directors raised uh, over $400,000 recently and have purchased those two additional licenses? That's very cool, Jill. Isn't it cool? Uh, The station has now tripled its listening area, area, you know, um, as she said, uh, Selena's Prunedale. Uh, Carmel, Carmel Valley, uh, Monterey, Pacific Grove, you know, Seaside, Marina, just just expanded, tripled it. And um, I am so proud of this board for doing that work. It's very hard as for a nonprofit to raise that kind of money. Yeah, it really is. That's, that's marvelous. Isn't it? Um, Andrew, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, Tom, uh, thanks for being here. My question is, hey, given, our cur- yeah, given our current state of... Um, how hard corporate and business uh, and the powers that be are trying to maintain their power by repealing rights. Where do you see, how do you blend that with your saying this may be our biological imperative to, to be more democratic? What's the pathway from here to there in your view? Well, every, every, um, every society, uh, and one of the better books on this was actually published in 1968 or 69 by uh, Peter Farb. It was called Man's Rise to Civilization. And what he did is he documented 38 Native communities in the United States at first contact. At the very, you know, he got the reports from the people literally the very first time they had contact with these Native American communities. And um, all of them, or virtually, well, no, all of them had um, internal systems to deal with with people who tried to uh, acquire power. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just fascinating that, that these societies viewed um, the accumulation of wealth and the accumulation of power as a mental illness, essentially. And they would heavily ostracize people that they caught doing this kind of thing. And in some cases, even banish them from the community, which, in, depending on where you're located, could be a death path, a sentence because, uh, you know, in, in some of the more remote Remote parts, like among the Shoshone, that would have been a death sentence, uh, you know, in the deserts of Nevada. So um, what we're seeing here is something that is uh, uh, inconsistent with human nature. It's inconsistent with, with nature itself. Um, by the way, just to, to that point, when Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, he said, you know, it's a life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and he said this was the, the, the intention of nature's God. And... Um, when he wrote that, John Adams did the first uh, edit on the on the Declaration, and he scratched out nature's God and put in the Christian God. And then Jefferson got it back after uh, after Adams and, and Franklin had had a look at it, and, and he scratched out the Christian God and put back nature's God, which is still in the, you know, it's to this day the Declaration of Independence is nature's God, because they really believed that this was the natural way of life that, that they were observing in these other Native communities that did not include you know, dictatorial, uh, hierarchical political systems and did not include people accumulating great, great wealth. So, you know, you're absolutely right. This is a major crisis for our democracy, for our republic. And, uh, you know, the, the, A, the, the massive accumulation of wealth. We've got um, levels of wealth that we have literally never seen relative to the, to the wealth of the average population um, in the history of the United States. And we had some pretty substantial accumulations of wealth in the in from the 1830s to the 1860s, particularly in New York and down in the South. But um, this is way beyond that. We are we are in territory that uh, that the United States has never seen before. So um, I think that that produces its own natural pushback. And uh, I, I agree with uh, Neil Howe, who wrote the Fourth Turning Is Here, that. We have kind of run through the uh, and and Stanley Turchin or Peter Turchin, 
I think it's Peter, maybe it's Stanley, whatever. Uh, the guy who writes, um, you know, about the 40-year cycles, uh, Howe writes about 80-year cycles, that that we've kind of burned through 40 years of Reaganomics. And, uh, and I, in fact, I wrote about this in my last book, The Hidden History of uh, Neoliberalism, How Reaganomics Gutted the American Middle Class. I, I think people have figured out that it didn't work and that having all this wealth concentrated in a small number of hands um, you know, the billionaires in America made over $800 billion just in the first six months of this year, um, and whereas, you know, the bottom 90% made, made some, but, you know, nothing close to that. Um, I, I think this is a last gasp. I really do. I, now, I realize the Supreme Court in um, 76 and 78 in, in the Buckley decision and in the um, Bellotti decision ruled that, cor- that money is the same thing as as and corporations are persons, and that billionaires have that they have money that all of us do, and then they triple down on that in uh, with Citizens United in 2010, and that has led to not only the corruption of politics, you know, all across the country, um, particularly in the GOP, but also you see some Democrats uh, like Joe Manchin, you know, and Kirsten Cinema are on the take, but uh, but they're you know more the exception than the rule. Um, but it's also, you know, they also legalize bribery of themselves. And now we discover that Clarence Thomas and Sam Alito have been on the take for years, and, and uh, as was uh, uh, Scalia and, uh, and uh, Rehnquist. So I think this is an anomaly, Andrew. I, I think this time, I think that we're, we're starting to see a major pushback. You're seeing it with the rise of the union movements. You're seeing it with with young people uh, just, you know, uh, protesting this. I think the Occupy movement was the early warning signal, as it were, for for the the morbidly rich in this country. And uh, I I believe it's just a matter of time before uh, we get a significant enough Democratic majority at the federal level that we can at least have reasonable taxation. Right now, the average billionaire in America pays 3.4% as income taxes. I'm guessing you pay more than 3.4%. I know I do, um, because we're not billionaires and we don't have access to all those loopholes that they literally paid legislators to put into the tax code. So I, I have a feeling we're coming to the to the end of that. Well, at the end of your book, you do talk about, um, you state that revitalizing democracy in America won't be easy, but it is definitely worth the effort. Why? Well, because democracy works. <laughs> if you want to have a stable country, if you want to have a stable political system, you want as much democracy as you can get. And, of course, you know, the Republicans don't want a stable democracy or a stable political system. They want oligarchy. They want, the, you know, uh, they want a, a political system and an economic system in this, in, in this country that basically only benefits the truly wealthy, the morbidly rich, and, uh, you know, which is why they've been pushing so hard for oligarchy now for 40 years. And uh, the, the oligarchy is usually a transitional political system. Um, it, it, it almost always does one of two things. It either disintegrates in upon itself um, or it turns into full-out uh, fascism, basically, you know, a, a, a dictatorial regime. Um, you can see this in Russia. You can see it in Hungary. Um, and I think we're seeing the early stages of it here in the United States. Uh, Jimmy Carter on my program seven years ago said that because of Citizens United, America is no longer a democracy. It is an oligarchy. Um, And I think that, you know, he he was largely right. Um, But like I said, oligarchies don't, typically they don't last more than two generations if you look throughout history. Um, And so that's the choice. You know, as as our oligarchy begins to disintegrate, one of two things is going to happen. We're either going to flip fascist and the Republicans are going to take control, or we're going to become more small-D democratic and, you know, power is going to revert to the people, and the Democrats will be in control. You also talk about an agenda for democracy, what we could do about that, the kinds of things that we need to make sure happen. What are some of those? Most of those uh, were derived from the idea that if we believe that democracy is the right thing, and I think I build a strong case for that in the book, then the things that more than half of Americans want right now, we probably should be doing. 
And so, you know, a lot of the things, there's, there's 20 some odd things in that, in that fourth part of the book, you know, the, the kind of agenda for democracy. But most of them are things that poll way above 50%, you know, strengthening Social Security, making, you know, providing Medicare for all or having a national health care system that is inexpensive and, and covers everybody, uh, lowering the cost of pharmaceuticals. Um, uh, getting uh, giant corporations and foreign buyers out of the uh, out of the housing out of the residential housing market, um, and thus lowering rents and 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 uh, uh, home costs. Um, uh, let's see, well, breaking up monopolies. You know, I mean, I I, I don't have the book in front of me, so I, that's okay. <laughs> I, I've I got a remember. list. <laughs> Okay. Some of them are keep yeah. keep church and state separate, uh, you know, oh, yeah. make voting a right instead of a privilege. Uh, it can go on. I the twenty that you have uh, um, institute uh, instant runoff voting to make minority parties viable, abolish electoral college. You know, obviously busting up the media conglomerates. As you said, probably sixty percent, if not more, of the country already supports this, and yet we don't have um, a Congress that implements it. Is that because, remember the uh, Gillens and Page study that, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that we really... 2014. Yeah, that we really don't have a Congress that represents the people. Right, and that's because of the Supreme Court. That's because, you know, with Citizens United and, and uh, Buckley and Bilotti, they legalized bribery. And so now you've got, you know, right-wing billionaires and, and giant corporations that buy politicians. It's the very best investment you can make, you know, if, if uh, I, you got the average, like I said, the average billionaire in America is paying 3.4% in income taxes. Uh, that is not an accident. That's the result of their being able to buy politicians that having been legalized by the Supreme Court and then them actually doing it. So, you know, that's probably the first thing we need to do. And we, and, uh, we would have taken a big bite out of that with the For the People Act um, last year, uh, in, in, which passed the House of Representatives, um, and had uh, 51 votes in the Senate with Kamala Harris. But uh, the, the Republican filibuster, uh, Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin, refused to go along with uh, breaking the Republican filibuster or drilling a hole through it. And uh, therefore... The For the People Act, which would have uh, really strengthened our democracy and would have reduced uh, dramatically the impact of Citizens United, uh, did not pass. And that has to be one of the very first things. It has to be at the top of our agenda if we uh, acquire a sufficient majority in the 2024 elections for January 2025. Well, we certainly need to uh, take uh, the Senate uh, in 2024 as well. You know, one of the things that I just heard uh, Stuart Stevens say this morning, um, who was a Republican strategist, and he's talking about the oligarchs and also Donald Trump, in that they're not running for the Constitution, and they're not running for the rule of law. Yeah, I think that that's uh, that's an honest evaluation that... uh, uh, the Republicans are they're, 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 what they've what they've decided is that you know getting people motive the best way to get people motivated to vote is to uh, uh, engender hate, um, and the best way to win elections is to make it really really difficult for uh, Democratic voters for people voting in the areas that are heavily Democratic to vote, and so you end up with ten hour lines in, in uh, black and, and student neighborhoods. Um, and, uh, you know, the Supreme Court in 2018 legalized the secretaries of state in the red states just randomly throwing people off the voting rolls uh, in, in blue cities. Um, no, it's not randomly. They have to send them a postcard, and, you know, which mm-hmm. looks like junk mail. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it's, it's just, uh, you know, Brian Kemp threw over 100,000 people off the voting rolls just before he won against Stacey Abrams for the 50,000 vote margin. Um, you know, it's like this is not right, and the For the People Act would have taken care of all that. But you know, like I said, it, it, we got uh, we got shafted by these uh, two, two renegade Democrats. Yes. Sadly, well, to respect your thirty minutes, I wanted to thank you very much, Tom, for uh, coming back to Be Bold America on KSQD. 
and for, I think, your ninth book, The Hidden History of American Democracy. You have to have a round number of 10 <laughs> in this series. It just, you know, my high sense of order needs that. <laughs> okay. Well, we're talking to my to my publisher about that right now. Thank so you, we'll Tom. You may listen okay, to his thank radio you, show. Thank Andrew. you. You may listen to his radio show weekdays on the Pacifica Radio Network. Uh, Sirius XM and right here on KSQD. Learn more about Tom Hartman at TomHartman.com, TheHartmanReport.com, or reach him on Twitter at Tom underscore Hartman. And he's also on Substack.com. So thank you again, Tom, very much for your time. Thanks, Jill. And and Andrew, too. Thank you so much for for joining me. And next, uh, we'll be right back in two minutes to speak with Andrew Goldencrantz, chair of the Santa Cruz County Democratic Party, after this two-minute Jim Hightower commentary titled, The Supreme Court, a Nest of Clueless, Overprivileged Elites. I'm your host, Jill Cody. Here's an embarrassing turn of events. The six right-wing ideologues now controlling the Supreme Court recently decreed that helping some students get into college through affirmative action programs is henceforth unconstitutional. This is somewhere between clueless and cynical, since at least five of these six aloof Supremes got into colleges and law schools through higher education's most entrenched channel of affirmative action, family affluence, and elite connections. America's higher ed establishment has long promoted a self-serving conceit that entrance to its campuses is based on meritocracy. Blatant racial and gender discrimination, however, put the lie to that, so schools adopted affirmative action policies to help rebalance the mix. The six Supreme Partisans killed this effort, replacing it with nothing. Meanwhile, our college system is becoming even more exclusive because of a deeply ingrained institutional bias that deliberately shuts out millions of the best and brightest, no matter their race, gender, or religion. That bias is economic class. From prestigious private schools to most big-name state universities, recruitment and admission procedures overwhelmingly favor those families privileged to have money and social standing. No matter how smart or promising working class and poor students are, they're largely left out. New York Times columnist David Linhart reports that this class divide is sharp, with some colleges enrolling more undergraduates from the wealthiest 1% of families than from all the families in the bottom 60%. These far-right political justices, blind to the special privileges they've been given in life, are empiricly negating our people's hard-won progress toward, well, toward justice for all. This is Jim Hightower saying, all six need to be replaced, not merely with better judges, but with better human beings. The Hightower Radio Lowdown is made possible by you subscribers to Jim Hightower's Lowdown on Substack. Find us at jimhightower.substack.com. If you're just joining us for the first half hour of the program, we were speaking with Tom Hartman on his new book, The Hidden History of American Democracy. Now we are very fortunate to have Andrew Goldencrantz for the next half hour. Andrew has been a public educator for 35 years and since 2020 has been chair of the Santa Cruz County Democratic Party, representing 112,000 local Democrats. As part of his career in education, he conducted research at the American Museum of Natural History and developed public health curriculum at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Andrew's political organizing comes from his career experience and personal background and is driven to fight for a seat at the table for those who historically have not had one. Thank you, Andrew, for waiting and listening to Tom discuss the history of our American democracy. Welcome to Be Bold America. It's your first time. Thank you, Jill. It's good to be here, and what a treat to share the air with Tom and Jim Hightower. Good to be here. Yeah, well, I'm delighted that you could make it and, and be here. You listened to Tom that first half hour. What struck you most about listening to him? Well, I think that I think he makes a pretty clear case about the history of uh, attempts to concentrate power, and I think a lot of the rules and uh, decisions that he cites are devices that people in power use to maintain their power and deny other people power. Um, and so I was particularly struck by his reference to 
the data around a 60-year arc or an 80-year arc. I've seen the same thing from Robert Putnam, who wrote a great book called The Upswing. talks about the same thing. And he says we are possibly in the stage of bottoming out, and we can look forward to potentially things getting better as we move forward. Wahoo! <laughs> I hope they're right. Um, but it will take some work. Let me, let yes. me add one more thing. Go ahead, you know, of a course. Lot of us, uh, a lot of us are familiar with a term that I don't think Dr. King originated, but it's associated with him when he says the arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. I, I think I would say yes and, but it doesn't bend itself. It has to be bent through organizing and by applying um, human energy. Oh, very good. I like that. Um, and also, you know, I played the Jim Hightower about the Supreme Court. What are your thoughts about today's Supreme Court? What are we going to do? Well, <laughs> what yeah, can we do? Of course, and I think combining what uh, Tom said and what Jim Hightower said, is it, it seems to me that the key is really in increasing the majority in the Senate and getting close to a filibuster-proof process. We had that for a little while back when President Obama was elected in 2008. We had 60 votes, and look what happened. We got major progress towards uh, expanding health care. We got LGBT rights. We got, you know, enfranchised. And so that was... That didn't happen by itself. That happened because there were 60 or almost 60 votes uh, in the Senate as well as a Democratic president. Um, and that's, so that's where, uh, that's a big part of where our effort needs to be. Well, I, I think the Supreme Court is a very challenging issue, and it just is a domino effect from an individual person's vote to getting to the point where we can do something to expand or correct the Supreme Court or even impeach some of them. Uh, you, uh, people talk about not their vote not being worth anything. Oh, I don't vote. Every vote counts. Uh, I'm just very worried about how the Supreme Court, what they're going to do in the meantime. What do you think? Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, the court is not showing any signs of changing their direction. Um, and I think that with a Republican majority in the House, even a slim one, and a basically split Senate with a slight Democratic majority, impeachment's not really a viable option. No. Um, continued pressure for getting the same kind of ethics rules for Supreme Court members that exist for other members of the federal judiciary would be a baby step, but a, an important step in the right direction. Well, um, they're shameless. It just it's it's amazing how shameless they can see and read the papers and hear the reports. They know that they're they ha they have no ethics and it doesn't seem to matter to them. Um Chief Justice uh, um Roberts, this is his court. And for some reason, he's perfectly happy to have their reputation destroyed. Well, he was it was clear from his confirmation back during the George W. Bush administration that he was coming out of the business community. Uh, he did not have a background on the bench. He had a background as a corporate attorney and that his main agenda was to um, support um, the development of corporate power. And he's been, he's been successful in doing that. I don't agree with it, but he has been true to his word. Let's put it that way. Um, um, yeah. I Go think, ahead. You know, one of the things you mentioned, and I, and I want to, talk about this process that it's very easy, especially with the, the onslaught of social media, the momentum at the Supreme Court, all these different, uh, the, the inequality in the economy. It's so easy for people to disengage and say, I just can't anymore. I, I have to withdraw uh, for my own mental health. And I, I totally get that emotion, but I have to, I can't stress strongly enough what a bad idea that is. Um, Democracy works when people engage in the process. And I think we've seen that uh, in a couple of key cases. I think that the country potentially is going to turn these next couple of years on things like abortion rights, where states are going, not only did the Supreme Court go in the wrong direction, but states are then trying to leapfrog each other to say, who can go back the furthest in withdrawing people's rights? And the fact is, people are not going to stand for it. So that's, that's one example, but I think that's a way that people can engage. 
We've seen it in Georgia. We saw it in Pennsylvania last year. And uh, we almost saw it in um, Wisconsin. That came really within um, about uh, a, a, you know, a handful of votes per precinct. So I think this is a place where people can engage in a way that, they, that their participation can make a difference. I think that's what we all want. People want to be busy. They want to be informed. And they want to take actions that they think can matter. And I think there are, there are some important ways that that can happen. It's very important for people when they become overwhelmed, and I have to admit, I do too. Uh, I, I become overwhelmed, and it's, and it's very important for people to take care of themselves, to take a break from, from the news for a while, for a few days, or whatever it is, go to nature, take a walk, reassess um, what they stand for and what their mission is so that they can get inspired and go back into uh, fighting for this democracy, because I don't know if you were able to hear about what Trump said last night at a at a rally. Did you catch what he said? I have. Some... I did. I heard. I, I heard the the highlight reel. Yes, because he he basically said, "2024 20, is our final battle," and and put it in terms of that uh, when he gets pre- to be president, he will weaponize his this government, his government against his enemies, enlisting universities and professors and the media, and people like you and me and Tom. And it was a 99-minute speech of darkness, another carnage speech like his uh, uh, presidential acceptance speech. And what was really frightening is his followers clapping and agreeing and cheering, and he would keep saying that um, they're taking my freedom away, and next they're going to be taking your freedom away. And you know, with that kind of zealot um, outrage, they're they're definitely going to vote. So, with the progressives and and the Democrats and those who want to save democracy, and we do really have a very plain, uh, simple, clear decision: one party is for fighting for democracy, and one party is fighting for authoritarianism. And he is right. This is 2024 is our final battle. I just want to see democracy to win. Um, back to you, Andrew, after that rant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I agree with you. And not, I, I, you know, I say this not as a supporter of Mr. Trump, but that in some ways that's been the secret to his success all along, his political success, is when he speaks to fear and he speaks to hate, then... And uh, Tom Hartman started his talk today by talking about things that we understand from the natural world. One of the things that we learned from the natural world is that the fear, that portion of your brain, the fight or flight, that, that fear processing part of your brain is in the back of your brain, in the reptilian part of your brain. And it works about 100 times as fast as in front of your brain where we make more pro, proactive, thoughtful decisions. And so by attacking that, he is looking for that instantaneous emotional reaction. And he gets it. So there's clearly about a third of the country who are who will who are not going to get their minds changed. They are going to be Trump all the way down. And then there's about a third of the country that is opposed to that, opposed to him. And then there's about a third that are kind of in the middle that are gonna that are going to get swung. We think that they will get that we think that the potential is for swinging them on on a variety of issues. Let me give you just a couple of them. I talked about women's reproductive health, need, which is super uh, Andrew, important. Andrew, hold that thought yep. because I need to take another break. Hold that for okay. a minute. You are listening to Be Bold America on KSQD, 89.5, 89.7, and 90.7 FM, Many Voices, One Station. Want a friend to hear this interview? A free subscription to Be Bold America's podcast is available at Apple, Google, Radio Public, Spotify, and many more. I'm your host, Jill Cody. Join KSQD this evening at 6 for Tackling the Taboo Sunday Dinner. Mark Gardner welcomes Angel Rio Tutar, director of the UC Santa Cruz American Indian Resource Center, to discuss Native Americans on campus, and Shana Burns looking at vertical gardens and food independence. That's this evening from 6 until 7 here on KSQD, 90.7 FM and KSQD.org. If you're just joining us, we are now speaking with Andrew Goldencrantz, chair of the Santa Cruz County 
Democratic Party. And the current and we're talking about the current challenges facing democracy. Learn more about the Santa Cruz County Democratic Party by visiting cruzdemocrats.org. Okay, back to you, Andrew. What were you going to finish there? Andrew? She gets turned. Oh, there we go. Uh, oh, st start over, Andrew. I think we had a little. Yeah, go ahead. Start over. Uh, look better? Okay. Yeah. So I think there are a number of, there's a handful of issues where this race is going to get turned. It's pretty clear that on women's health, on women's reproductive health, that there is a substantial majority um, that is not in favor of taking these laws back to the pre-row uh, uh, conditions. So that's the first thing. Um, second thing is it's pretty clear that there are some people who are who maybe economically pretty conservative, but who are just not ready for a return to the chaos and the corruption that the Trump administration brought forward. And I think this is where President Biden, for all of his strengths and successes and all of his limitations, he promised kind of a return to normalcy and has largely delivered on that. Um, you see that in the way that he's viewed around the world. You see that in the way Congress is starting to work in a bipartisan way a little bit more. Um, and then the third thing is I think we have an effective infrastructure that we're part of, which is like here in your broad, in our broadcast area, all right, this is a reliably pretty blue place. And it's easy to get complacent. But we mobilized over 100,000 postcards to Georgia and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin last year uh, for the Senate races and won two of those three. And so I think remembering that in 2024, it's not one national race. It's 50 races, one state at a time. And that that's where the personal connections are going to work. It's not going to be the emails. It's not going to be the texts that we get all the time. It's not even going to be the TV, TV advertising. It's going to be the personal connections. So what we did, oh, we've been doing this since 2018, is we do handwritten postcards to either new voters or people who are not, um, uh, who are intermittent voters in those swing states and talk about the importance of voting and the stakes of things that are going to be on the ballot. And our data shows that we increased the turnout by 8%. As a result of oh, our excellent, so that's we, a lot. Yeah, so we that we've got, you know, again, it's it's not like one thing is going to be a magic wand, but we think that's an example of the kind of work that is going to be really important. Well, I understand that there are um, probably mostly in our swing states, but about seventeen House of Representative seats that are on very fine Republican margins. There's seventeen more Republicans in Congress right now. And I think that if that kind of strategy is used towards those 17 on the edge, repu currently held Republican congressional seats, they could be swung over to Democratic seats and then really get to maybe a, a, a strong amount of, uh, or, you know, a, a ma majority or even a supermajority in the Congress. Is that your understanding too? Yeah, I think the House is right for, for flipping back to Democratic majority. And I think part of that is the real self-destructive last six months that we've seen from Speaker McCarthy and his Republican majority is they just have not, they, they haven't delivered on anything meaningful. It's a little bit of a circus. Um, and um, it, well, it, it, as depressing as it is, I, I think we're going to see more of that between now and next fall. So I think, yeah, the House is there for the taking. But when it comes back to where we started the conversation about things like appointing judges, all of that, that's the Senate. That's the Senate. That's right. We need to get enough um, people coming out to compensate for the gerrymandering that has happened in these swing states. Uh, it's 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 an uphill battle, but one that we can win. Um, Stuart C. Stevens, and again, to say he was a Republican strategist, oh, yeah. no. also said um, that there needs to be zero daylight between Democrats and support of Biden. And what worries me, and I want to get your thoughts on, is what um, uh, RFK Jr. is doing and what the New Labels organization is doing, because both of them 
can take away from uh, the Democratic Party, not the Republican Party. And if we need zero daylight, and that's a Republican strategist telling us that, because he said, really, Biden won with just a little over 40,000 votes because of the Electoral College. So he may have gotten 7 million more Democratic votes, but with the Electoral College, he only won by 40,000-something votes. So it's, it's really closer than we think. And he said no labels is incredibly dangerous. What are your thoughts on that? Well, yeah, um, the no labels thing is a real threat. Uh, I think Manchin, on the one hand, Senator Manchin is not electable. I don't think that America is ready to support a coal millionaire <laughs> um, who has, has worked to slow down, you know, work on climate change um, and has fought expansion of health care. So I, I don't think that he's just got the resume to do it. Um, but I was talking about Robert coal, F. Kennedy Jr., too. I mean, that's... Talk, yeah, 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 yeah. So Kennedy, that's a completely different situation. So Manchin, I don't think himself uh, is, a, is a winning formula, but the idea of running a moderate who's going to take some Republican oh, votes and take... That's Democratic right. Votes. Manchin yeah, is who No Labels is putting up, correct? I'm sorry. That's New Lambo, yeah, No yeah. Labels, right. Right. And the Kennedy stuff, look, I, I've been follow, I've been paying attention to RFK Jr. because of my work in public health, where his extreme anti-vaccination um, policies are really what brought him prominence. Um, his prior history as a as an environmental reformer, as an environmental lawyer, is is laudable. But his recent forays into anti-vaccine stuff, and he's totally sponsored by like Steve Bannon, and you know people really on the kind of Newsmax side of the Republican spectrum, um, who well, are really on the neo-fascist to- side of the Republican yeah. spectrum. Yes. Yeah, and I'll say this as uh, as a Jewish American that he has engaged in some really harsh commentary. Uh, he made a reference yesterday to ethnic targeting of COVID, and he t- and he's used Holocaust references. Yes, I saw uh, that. Mm-hmm. They're just really um, put him outside the, like a normal conversation in a way that for me is completely unacceptable. Um, but in Santa Cruz, it's going to be interesting because. There's going to be a, a a small but noisy portion of kind of the libertarian left, like um, people who distrust government, who distrust big institutions, and then people on the libertarian right who are just looking to destabilize the whole process. So it's, it's going to be an interesting confluence in Santa Cruz. Again, not enough to win, but maybe enough to rock the boat a little bit. But we got to watch out for that. Well. In the last few minutes, uh, do you have any ideas on what we could keep doing, stop doing, and start doing to work towards a thriving democracy? Our future depends on it. Well, we have, um, so there's a couple things in play. Um, The first is, as I mentioned, there are a number of either through the Democratic Party or on a nonpartisan basis for people who prefer to do that, these um, phone banks and postcarding campaigns into the swing states. So Swing Left does a great job. Uh, We also work with a group called Reclaim Our Vote, which focuses on um, majority um, communities of color, usually in the South. Uh, And that's that's been loosely, that that was kind of an affiliate of the um, Casey Abrams Fair Fight operation. So Reclaim Our Vote has, has done some great work around here. Um, Indivisible has done some really good work. So there are different kinds of new networks that are really helpful. Um, The second is to participate um, in organizing the unorganized. So whether it's, for example, like around here, there has been a lot of activity, and I think they totally deserve our support when we see organizing of Starbucks workers, uh, of the fast food campaigns, um, yeah, in this case, watching what's going on with the Teamsters and UPS, who were fighting for the right to have air-conditioned trucks so that when they're driving in 110-degree weather. Oh, what happened? I, I don't hear him. Did you plug in my headset? Oh, oh dear. I just lost him. 
I'm sorry, folks, here. Well, one of the things that I was going to say to Andrew is uh, that the, you know, the Donald Trump, the third of the country, they want to divide, distrust, delay, and demonize. And I was thinking that we need to unite, uh, be trustworthy, act now, act now, and we're all in this country together. And I think I'm changing headset. Hold on. <laughs> Andrew, are you there? No, I don't hear him on your headset either. We don't know what happened. I'm sorry, listeners. Here, let me get back to my headset because it still is empty. Okay, well, let's get... So I'm going to thank Andrew for being our bold guest today and a bold leader in Santa Cruz County. Uh, Andrew does invaluable work towards saving our democracy Thank you for the gift of your time while on vacation. What's up next on Be Bold America? Join us Sunday, July 31st at 5 p.m. when our topic will be, Are You Being Gaslighted? What are the telltale signs? We will be speaking with Dr. Robin Stern, a licensed psychoanalyst and co-founder and associate director for Yale University Center for Emotional Intelligence. In 2007, Dr. Robert Robin Stern coined the phrase gaslight effect to explain the long-term effects of repeated gaslighting and insidious and sometimes covert form of emotional abuse in which a gaslighter undermines and controls another person by deflecting, twisting, and denying their reality. In every case, gaslighting leaves you constantly second-guessing yourself, unable to make simple decisions, and destabilized from the constant reality shifts. Dr. Stern is the author of The Gaslight Effect, How to Spot and Survive the Hidden Manipulation Others Use to Control Your Life. And now she's completed The Gaslight Effect Recovery Guide that helps you turn off the gas. In addition, she is the host of The Gaslight Effect Podcast. Don't miss... Are you being gaslighted? What are the telltale signs on Sunday, July 31st at 5 p.m. when Dr. Stern will offer invaluable insights into the dynamics of gaslighting and the impact on our emotional and national well-being? I want to give a special thank you to Be Bold America's program engineer and Eliza James to our program director, Howard Feldstein, and again to our bold and always impressive guest, Tom Hartman, Please visit TomHartman.com, HartmanReport.com, and you may contact him at Tom underscore Hartman on Twitter. And another big thank you to Andrew Goldenkrantz, chair of the Santa Cruz County Democratic Party. Visit CruzDemocrats.org. You are listening to KSQD Santa Cruz, KSQT Prunedale, Many Voices, One Station. Listen world worldwide online at KSQD.org. Stay tuned for Tackling the Taboo Sunday Dinner with Mark Gardner. My name is Jill Cody, and thank you for listening to Be Bold America. Until next time, keep, stop, start, 